All right, guys, we are back for section 11, where we are talking about integrated theories, which is when you take, essentially, two or more theories, shove them together. Okay, so we got to start with our funny internet picture of the day. And this, this is exactly who you should not try and be. Like, don't, don't try to pass yourself off as an expert in, uh, in any kind of criminal thing, even, you know, no matter how much of the criminal minds and CSI and stuff you watched, even when you're a, uh, a criminal justice major. You know, um, it takes a lot of work to become a criminal justice expert. And, um, like, I don't even consider myself a criminal justice expert in all the different fields of, of criminology and criminal justice. And I've got a Ph.D. in the subject. So, um, you know, keep, keep yourself humble, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so, when you're integrating theories, when you're taking two or more theories and shoving them together, there's a few different ways you can do it, Okay. Um, one way you can do it is to do what's called an end-to-end -end integration, which means um, essentially what you're saying is this theory happens kind of first in the lifetime of a criminal, and then this other theory also happens, and then the combination of the two is what really explains crime, right? Um, there's a little difficulty sometimes in determining um, kind of which came first. If you're going to integrate two theories, which one goes first, which one goes second, on the other hand, a lot of time there's not. For instance, biological theories. Biological theories, um, unless you're talking about, you know, an injury or something that happened later in life, um, those are obviously things that would come first in time pretty much no matter what other theory you're integrating it with, right? So biological theory, if you're going to do an end-to-end -end integration, is essentially always going to come first. Um, but you could also say, you know, like um, uh, social bonding comes first, you know, and if you have... Um, terrible bonds with your family and then put in learning theory which is where you know it's both a lack of bonds with your family and then a, a learning from your delinquent peers in your teenage years um, that causes crime so that's kind of taking those two different theories and and saying this one happens first then this one happens and that's really a better explanation of crime than either of the two um, individually you can also do a side-by-side -side integration, which essentially means both of these happen, but they're explaining different kinds of crime, right? Because crime is this very vastly um, uh, different process depending on what kind of crime you're talking about. There's probably a much different reason for people committing bank fraud than there is for people committing mass murder, right? Um, there's probably a different reason for committing shoplifting and rape. Right. Um, so essentially what these side by side integrations do is say, look, these both explain crime, but they explain different kinds of crime. Right. So maybe this theory explains white collar crime and this theory explains um, impulsive violent crime. And this third theory explains, you know, non impulsive violent crime. So you can you can kind of stack theories sideways like that. Um, uh, then there's up and down, which is essentially. Um, there's two different ways to do this. One is called theoretical reduction, which is where you take one theory and then say this theory belongs within this other existing theory as a part of it, right? Um, so, for instance, um, the, uh, uh, um, oh gosh, I'm totally blanking on the name of it. Sutherland Differential Association. Um, Differential association can kind of be subsumed into differential reinforcement, right? There's nothing about differential reinforcement that contradicts anything in, in um, uh, differential association, right? So you're kind of taking one theory and, and putting it into another and saying, look, this is a part of this theory. And the second theory is, is larger, but that first theory fits just real perfectly within that. So it's, it's you know, we're really talking about one big theory when we're talking about... Um, um, uh, um, social differential reinforcement, right? Differential reinforcement is really two different theories, differential association and then differential reinforcement, which is wider than differential association, but contains all of differential association. Then there's theoretical synthesis, where we take two theories, take either pieces or all of it, and create a new big third theory, right? Um, where we can say, you know, we're gonna take a piece from social learning and we're gonna take a piece from labeling and we're gonna take a piece from bonding and we're gonna shove those together into a mutant new 
theory that has elements of those two or three or four other theories in it. You can do that in kind of, there's a few different ways to do that. One of the ways to do these kind of things is um, what's called a conceptual integration, where you're saying, look, this theory measures this thing, and this other theory measures this other thing, but honestly, they're really measuring the same thing, right? So for instance, you might say that Agnew's general strain theory measures lack of coping skills, right? But then the general theory of crime measures lack of self-control. You could argue that those two are really measuring, when it gets right down to it, the same thing, right? Lack of self-control and lack of adequate coping mechanisms. So you could say, look, it's, it's not that these theories are really all that different. It's they're, they're, they're both really measuring the same concept there. Um, and we can kind of join the two at the hip if we pretend like those two theories are measuring the same concept. And then there's theoretical elaboration, where essentially you're taking a theory and you're kind of further refining it. So it's kind of the opposite of what we talked about with subsuming. It's saying, look, this theory's good, but it's too wide. We need to further kind of add in like this other thing that, that not necessarily narrows the focus, but kind of focuses the theory um, a little better about what it's trying to do and what it can explain and what it can't explain. Um, two of the things you need to worry about when you're doing any of these different kind of integrations are one, levels of analysis, right? Some theories are micro theories, meaning they explain the behavior of individuals, and some theories are macro theories, meaning they explain the behaviors of groups. Now you can combine two micro, two macro, or a micro and a macro, but you have to be aware of how that interacts with how you're trying to um, integrate those theories. It's not necessarily a problem to mix and match, but it can be if you're not careful. And then finally, you have to worry about contradictory assumptions, right? Because um, early in an earlier section, we talked about how some um, theories assume that people are inherently good and some outside force has to turn them evil. And some theories believe humans are inherently bad and some outside force has to keep them from practicing that evil, keep them from, from expressing that evil through the commission of a crime, right? And again, people have attempted to combine two different theories with two different contradictory assumptions into one and try to explain it away, um, but it is definitely a difficulty when you're trying to take any two different theories and put them together. But the important thing is that these integrated theories are um, kind of, I would argue, my personal opinion, that they're really needed. Because no individual theory, after a hundred and some odd years of, of studying crime as a scientific thing and trying to do research on crime and, and you know trying to figure out really what causes crime, even our best theories only explain a very small amount of crime. So when you take, to give you kind of a very basic statistics lesson, when you take a whole bunch of different variables and shove them into a regression equation, no matter which kind of regression equation you're talking about, um, the statistics will tell you kind of how much of that, that dependent variable, in this case, it's almost always crime, each of the different independent variables can explain. And the theories we've talked about in this entire course a lot of them, when we test and see like how much of the crime does this explain, it's really low. Some of these theories, like it's statistically significant, but it only explains 5%, 10%, 20% of the variation in, in whether people commit crime or not. So even the best theories have a really low kind of ability to predict or, or explain why people are committing crimes. So these theorists have been creating these, these integrated theories to try to increase that amount of explanatory power, right? Um, and there are a few examples I wanna talk about. The first one is Eliot's integrated model, right? And he's taking ideas from kind of three, four, five different theories and putting them together end to end and um, kind of simultaneously um, uh, at the same time, not just end to end. So essentially what, what, what Elliot's integrated model says is in the beginning, you have A strain, 
B, adequate, inadequate socialization, meaning you're not kind of raised right, essentially. Um, and then C, social disorganization, right? And those three things kind of in the beginning causes weak bonding or weak conventional bonding, weak bonding with your family and, and uh, you know, your, your law abiding people and, and churches and schools and, you know, those kind of traditional um, positive groups that we want you to bond with. And then that leads to strong delinquent bonding, right? So, I mean, we've got, we've got strain there. We've got social disorganization. We've got bonds. We've got a uh, kind of learning theory, right? So these four, five different theories, depending on what you are claiming Eliot's uh, integrating here, have kind of worked together um, and, and, you know, it's not necessarily A causes crime or B causes crime. It's A, B, and C interact with D, and then D interacts with E, and A, B, and C also kind of interact with E, and then E, and then all of that together as a whole causes crime, right? Next one, Thornberry's interactional theory, okay? This is essentially taking learning theory and expanding it. He's saying, look, one of the one of the big negatives about learning theory is it's hard to figure out whether delinquent peers cause crime or people who are going to commit crime anyway want to seek out delinquent peers, right? So he kind of gets past that that um, problem by saying it's a feedback loop, right? We've all heard about feedback loops, right? Where A causes B, but then B causes A, which means A causes B, and then B causes A, and it, and it just goes, and it's a cycle, right? That's essentially what he says about learning theory. It's that people who want to commit crime get delinquent peers, and people with delinquent peers commit more crime, and then that means they want to... So it's, it's kind of a feedback loop. Uh, being the kind of person who, who wants to commit crime and having delinquent peers feed off of each other. A causes B, which causes A, which causes B, which causes A, back and forth and back and forth, and it becomes a cycle, and that's kind of how learning theory works. So it's not necessarily one or the other, it's both that is causing this crime, right? Um, one of my favorites, one of the ones I think is the most interesting is Braithwaite's theory of reintegrative shaming, okay? <clears throat> reintegrative shaming is a, is a very, very interesting concept. And to, to learn more about it, we can kind of look at Japan. Japan is a vastly different culture than the United States. I used to live there back in the 80s, very young, very young little kid. Um, but I, I remember that they had a very different kind of view of life and society than we did in the United States. Um, so with reintegrative shaming, essentially he's combining strain, labeling, and bonding, right? And what it says is, essentially, when someone does wrong, we need to figure out why they did it wrong, right? Which can be the strain, the labeling, the lack of bonds, all these things, right? And then shame them, right? Do some kind of um, punishment. And, and in Japan, the, a huge percentage of the time, this is just a public apology. Like the person who committed the crime, and we're talking really serious crimes here. This is not just in use with, you know, shoplifting and stuff. We're talking serious crimes. The person will kind of get up in public and apologize formally to the victims, right? But then, here's the important part, then they are reintegrated into the society. There's, there's a, a proactive acceptance of, we recognize your apology, um, thank you for acknowledging your wrong and, and vowing to kind of fix the problems and, and do these things. Now we wanna help you with that. We wanna help you kind of bring you back into society, re-embrace you, um, make sure that you're, you're part of our group again and that you feel like you're part of our group and that you feel um, accepted and, and that you feel like you're really part of the community again, right? And in the United States, we kind of do the opposite, right? When somebody gets out of prison, it's almost impossible for them to find a job because instead of reintegrating them, we're continuing to, to shame them. We're continuing to ostracize them. We're continuing to keep them as other right? And so this becomes an explanation of why the recidivism rate in the United States is so much higher than the recidivism rate in Japan. 
because we're not reintegrating people. We're labeling them, um, which causes more strain, fewer bonds, right? Then of course they go out and commit crime again. Whereas in Japan, they take away the strain, they take away the label, and they give more of the good kind of bonds on purpose in a proactive way and reintegrate those people back into the community. Does that make sense? All right. These last two, these are these are really interesting. These are, are um, I'm not sure about these, but these are, are, are definitely interesting ones. The first one's kind of, it's called control balance theory, right? It's, it's essentially says that every person needs to have a balance of the control that they're that they're under and the control that they're able to wield, right? So when when the amount of control I'm under due to you know um, oversight from my job and uh, my parents and you know all these things is proportional and balanced with the amount of control I have over others, i.e how I treat my employees, how I treat my kids, how I treat my pets, how I treat my, you know, the decisions I'm able to make about controlling the world around me. When those two are in balance, we're not gonna have a lot of crime. But when the control I'm under, i.e. those exercising control on me, is over, is higher than the amount of control I'm able to exercise, I'm gonna commit things like, you know, uh, violent crime and and um, you know, going out there and, and, and stealing a car and, and kind of reacting to that lack of control over my universe and my world and my um, surroundings. In the opposite way, if I have too much control over others but nobody has control over me, then I'm, commit, I'm going to commit things like um, you know, embezzlement, right? Because I think I can get away with it or stock fraud or you know, something, something like that where, where there's not enough outside control over my life. I feel like I can do whatever I want, so I do whatever I want, um, and then hopefully, ultimately, um, I get caught because, you know, I'm committing these crimes. Um, but it's but it's about a lack of, of control. It's about a lack of, of balance in the amount of control you're subject to and the amount of control you're able to exercise, okay? And the final one is Hagen's power control theory, which is really interesting. It's about the, the balance of power in your... Uh, between your parents at home. So if your if your father has too much power in the family, um, that will cause boys to kind of um, feel uncontrolled and thus go out and commit deviance more. If the mother has too much power in the family, um, it it's it affects the kids in 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 these weird different ways, right? Depending on who has more power, um, who has more kind of authority, and who's kind of dominating the, the social structure of the household, right? Um, anyway, that's a very interesting one. So the point with these integrated theories is that we're really trying to take these individual theories, which really can't explain a lot of crime. Even the best theories only understand, uh, only explain a really fairly small percentage of the variation in crime. We're trying to take two or more of these and see if we can't bring them together to get a larger um, percentage of that crime being explained by saying, look, this theory has it right a little bit, and this theory has it right a little bit, and this theory has it right a little bit, but let's try to kind of figure out how they can work together. And if this theory explains 10% of crime, and this theory explains 10% of crime, and this theory explains 10% of crime, maybe we can shove them together and explain 30% of crime, right? Um, but it's a much more difficult process than it sounds like. Anyway, that's enough for section 11. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it.